want to speak this morning on ancient dreams and contemporary pursuits. We could maybe say ancient dreams revisited today. Um, and I think it's, it's very familiar to us. We live in it. We have lived in it our lives where we had to guard ourselves against the pursuit of the things that are temporal. And the Ecclesiastes chapter, the whole book, is about pursuing dreams that are futile. When it comes in comparison to eternity, and it is empty without having the focus of Christ being present and living the way he wants us, and living for his honor and glory. And so Ecclesiastes is about that. And the writer tells us how he pursued whatever came to him. Pleasure, wealth, elaborate buildings, all kinds of architectural stuff. Anything that brought, uh, was pleasing to him. Even the whole area of pleasure seeking. And in the end, he says, here's my conclusion. It's empty. So in a sense, here's a guy that could say to us, been there, done that. Believe me, it's a dead end. But I believe we are seeing it. Every generation has to wrestle with it. What should we pursue? Where's that line when we cross over and we have forgotten that Christ should be central, God should be central, and we have kind of gone off on a little chasing of the wind, as this writer puts it many times. The word Ecclesiastes means preacher, or one who addresses the assembly. For those of you who know the German, and you have a German Bible, the German Bible says Prediger. We, in English, call it Ecclesiastes. But in the German, it says Prediger. And that's more of the direct translation of uh, the preacher. And that's what King Solomon was. He, was. he was, in a sense, the preacher who spoke the word. He spoke what he had experienced, and he spoke what he realized to be the truth, the focus that he should have had in his life. And in the end, he says, we need to remember that we will give account before God. Uh, he will judge us. In this book, chapter 1, or all the way through chapter 12, 29 times or more, he mentions life under the sun or life under heaven. And, and with that, he's, he's reminding us, this is the temporal focus. It's a focus on this particular life instead of having the bigger picture the eternal picture. And also 37 times or more he uses the word meaninglessness or vanity. It is, it is useless. It is empty. This is his perspective. Now let's get the picture here. I want to just read a few of the verses out of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And he says this way, starting in verse 2. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go. But the earth never changes. The sun rises, the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south, then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. And I think we've, we've often heard the statement, we've said it ourselves. Well, what is it with these winter winds, right? They, they blow in from the north and we are freezing and... Then, after a week, it stops and it shifts to the south, and then you've got icy, chilly south winds blowing in. This is exactly what he's saying. It blows in from the north, then it blows in from the south. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the waters return again to the rivers and flow out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we're not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past and in future generations. No one will remember what we are doing now. 
this is the king's um, description of life without keeping Christ central. It, it's rather intriguing. He says, generations come and generations go. Isn't it interesting? According to stats, it says that approximately 400,000 people are born a day in our world. Approximately. They haven't got a, a definite figure. But it says approximately 150,000 die per day. So we're always gaining a population. But the point is, how many of you know my great-grandfather? Nobody, right? You see, you didn't even know he existed. He's forgotten. We don't ever really mention him in our family circle. Why? Because life goes on, generation after generation. And the thing is, each generation has to again come to grips with what does it mean to live the way God wants us to live in this world. Every generation has to come to grips with that. If we don't, if we just follow what one generation has done, gradually we veer off more and more. We have to come back to the Word of God and see, what does it tell me? How am I supposed to live? And how does how we're living measure up with what He wants? Have we already veered off quite a bit? And in my books, I think we have. We have veered off already quite a bit. Generations after generations, it seems like we slowly erode until God does an awakening within us and we come back to Him with enthusiasm and excitement. And he talks about how the sun rises and sets, then hurries back to where it will rise again. We know that. The sun rose this morning, and last night we saw it set. And it hurries back to be ready for the morning, and it sets again. It's just seven days a week, 50 day, 52 weeks in the year, year after year. And about the winds blowing. And then he talks about the streams that are flowing into the sea and, and then it's back into the rivers and they flow back in and yet the, the, the lakes and the oceans, they're never filled. And it talks about how we never get tired of seeing. The eye has never enough of seeing. We delight in things and, and we want to see more. The ear has never enough of hearing. And it talks about there's nothing new under the sun. That's maybe a little puzzling. Um, yet, um, you know, when you think of building bridges, and maybe they do it differently today than they did years ago, yet we build. Um, people built houses way back. If you go into Israel, you see how many of the houses were built with stone. Nowadays, if they build with stone, it looks completely different than that. Most of the stones have been nicely cut. Uh, and yet Israel had a lot of those things too. You, you kind of um, are fascinated how could they have these huge boulders that they've placed on walls? Thousands of pounds. How did they do it? They didn't have these big cranes that we have nowadays. And yet they did. They built. And today, today's generation builds, but they do it in a different way. So they're, in a sense, nothing new under the sun. But then he says, all of us are forgotten after we die. Verse 11. You know, it's, it's intriguing to me. Um, there are people who, who actually make it their goal that they will have as many items or buildings or, or things that will have their name on there so that people won't forget them when they die. But my question is this. Will Mueller Industries, will people remember who he was 50 years from now? I don't think so. Because generations die and life goes on, people forget. Even in, at Briarcrest, there are study halls that are, that are named after some of the great teachers of the past. You know, when people come in there to study, they don't ask themselves, who is this person? That's insignificant to them. The, the thing that's significant is they're here to study. To study the Word of God. And so, 
the person who's, who, who is it named after is insignificant to them, except for the people that were there at the time. And so 50 years, 100 years down the road, it is insignificant. Uh, Solomon says in chapter 2 and carrying on what he all pursued. And I think those are the basic things that we pursue today. It is fun, fortune, and fame. Basically three things. Fun, fortune, fame. That's what people want. And that's what Solomon set his heart on to pursue. The world does this. But how much are we caught up in that? That we are, in a sense, living no different. That we make it a goal we want to become wealthy. We want to have, we want to have power. We want to have, we want to be known by what we have. And yet, that's not what life is about. And that's what Solomon is trying to tell us. You were created for something bigger. You and I, as God's people, are created for something much bigger than just the wealth and the fame and that we can gather here. We were created to bring glory to God, to fulfill His kingdom, His kingdom purposes. That's what we were created for. And so though there is nothing wrong with material things, there's nothing wrong with working hard and earning, but when we begin to set our hearts on that, that, that becomes the thing. We have been led astray. Think of the Roman Empire. When you think of the story of the prodigal son, and it says this younger son said, Dad, give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. And so he traveled off. It says to a faraway country. The faraway country didn't mean thousands and thousands of miles. But it was a culture that was so contrary to what he grew up in. He was moving over into the Roman culture. You see, when you go to Israel, you see the Colosseums. There's a mass of Colosseums. The purpose of those Colosseums was pleasure, entertainment, but that's not all. It was to lure and slowly ingrain in the people that this is how you should live. So as to lure away God's people, if nothing else. Roman wanted everybody else to live like they, without God. And so that was their goal. Lure them. Slowly lure them into it. And so people came. And this prodigal son had been enticed by what he saw. And left what he had been trained with and walked over. You and I are experiencing that today. In the last 10 years, it has been scary to see how many of the younger generation are falling away. They're no longer wanting church. They're no longer wanting that because they've been enticed by the world. Education and entertainment is what is used by the world to do us, to brainwash us, to, to break down the barriers so we become more and more like them. And so we are losing youth by the dozens because of it. That's why it is so important for us as parents, as grandparents, that we have the example, that we truly live it the way God wants us to live. That we are not just focusing on these material things and on having pleasure and having fun, but that we recognize God is far more concerned about our obedience and being conformed to the, His image than He is about our happiness. Because happiness is a byproduct. So God's focus is for us to be obedient, to be conformed to the image of His Son. And sometimes it takes hardships for that to happen. But we are a generation, as Paul says in 2 Timothy, in the last days, people will be irritated. They will have total disrespect for anything sacred. And we are living exactly in that age. He says people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. People take sports far more important than church services. And that's true. That, that is true for a lot of people. And that's scary. Because it tells us where we are beginning to bend and slowly cave in. 
I'm concerned. I'm concerned for my grandkids. I'm concerned for the younger generation because the lure of the world is so powerful on us. And Satan is at work. And seeing that the end is coming nearer, he works that much harder to try to lure us over to him and to fight against God in this way. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17, John writes it this way, he says, don't love the world nor the things that are in this world. And I want to just read those verses. He says, do not love this world nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our own achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but everyone who does what pleases God will live forever. This is the challenge that you and I face, that I am faced with. Would I rather just sit on my iPad and play games or surf, uh, see what's all for sale out there, or would I rather get into the Word, or would I spend time focusing on what God wants me to do? You see, it's so easy with the entertainment world to get distracted, and it can become such a waste of our time when we could be concerned about the lost. And I think that's another thing that materialism does to us, is we, we forget that there's a world out there that needs Jesus. We forget that without Christ, people are lost. They will not be in heaven. That's what the Bible says. And we need to be serious about that and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? We need to pray that God will bring people into our lives that he wants us to be a witness to. And folks, let's not kid ourselves. We will never be ready to do it until we do it. Seriously. Brand new Christians are one of the most powerful witnesses out there. Why? Because they're so excited. They're pumped about what has happened in their lives. And they also have the connection still to the, to the unsaved. So for us, we will never be ready if we want to wait for something magical. We just need to jump in. We have to jump in and just say, okay, God, I'll sink, or you'll drop, you'll pull me out, and you'll carry me. And he will. In Leamington, Ontario, people with, with great aid, education, very poor English, would challenge university students at their workplaces. And they would be stumped by questions. They would come back to church on Sunday or to Bible study. They'd say, okay, I had a discussion with somebody and it went well until they raised this question and I didn't know what to say. What do I say? Now we talk about it, they go back. You see, we are ready as we are to share the Word of God. And as we do, we will grow and develop like we've never developed before. That's what happens when we get involved. And so I want to challenge us. Are we living the way God wants us to live? That's a question that somebody asked me a while back. Have we missed the mark? Have we missed it as, as a Christian world, the way God wants us to live? And I think there's elements in which we definitely can grow and become more closer. So we need to just ask God to show us the way, that He will show us where we need to change so we can go back to where He wants us to be. In the end, Ecclesiastes puts it this way. Chapter 12 is sort of his summary. Verse 13, he says, Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of every human being. And verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. 
let's take the advice that Solomon gave. Solomon was said by God to be the wisest person on earth at that time. Yes, he floundered around in some of his life. But in the end, he came back and he said, I missed it. I missed it. I left God out. And the only way we can have purpose and meaning in our life is that He is central. That we surrender to every area in our life to Him and live the way He wants. So I want to challenge us, I want to encourage us. Take it from one who was there, Solomon, who says, I've been there, I've done that. But it's empty unless you put Christ back into the center. And that all our life, everything that we do, revolves around that. Whether we build bridges, whether we build houses, whether we're nurses, or whether we're construction people, whatever it may be. Whether we're a mother at home or a dad. Whether we're retired. God said, keep me central. And life will be meaningful. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Unless the time comes where you look back and you say, I regret it. I have no pleasure in it. You see, that happens to a lot of people. In the end, they look back and they say, oh man, I wish I had seen this earlier. Why didn't somebody tell me earlier? Why didn't somebody confront me and so that I could change earlier? But this is, this is the reminder for us. He says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Because the time will come and we'll look back and say, Oh man, why did I waste so much time on earthly things instead of living for God? Let's pray. Father, we come before you with the recognition that perhaps all of us in one way or in a few ways have kind of missed the mark. We tend to so easily gravitate towards the temporal things. Even though there's nothing wrong with having things, but then we allow them to grab our hearts instead of truly being in love with you. And so Lord Jesus, we come and ask you to open our eyes, to the things where we have gone astray. Show us the way back. May you enlighten our understanding. And Father, we pray above all that you will just put within our hearts again a deep, deep burning desire to see others coming to know you. Not just by sending out missionaries, Lord, but by reaching out to people in this community. People that you direct us to. Help us to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who would ask us of why do we have so much hope. Lord, we pray for our children, our grandchildren who are being bombarded by a world that so um, forcefully wants them to live the way they do. Where they want to take away the rights of those who are people of faith. God, I pray that you will help them to be courageous, to be strong, May we, as parents and grandparents, lead by example. We ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen.